Let's see if we can get our, our union people to come up front, um, at least sit in the front row or, or something to... Uh, Dave, you feel like coming up and... Who else was our main union people here with some... You know, thing and maybe people who were union officials or union. We had a couple, anyhow. I guess they're still eating. <coughs> um, I wanted here. I'm not going to bother with the slideshow. I was looking at it. It's a slideshow I gave in another place, and it was uh, it was very good for non-Georgists, but it had a lot of things in it that we already understand. But I just did want to introduce the topic of uh, protection or free trade because Terence Powderly's objection was if land value tax is as good as you say it is, nobody will be able to compete with us. And so free tr campaigning for free trade won't get you land value tax but campaigning for land value tax will get you free trade. And Henry George's own book tended to agree. He had a chapter, you know, he argued for free trade for, for 17 chapters before he started talking about the weaknesses of free trade and why labor won't support it. So, so people on, in, involved in labor never got through the first 17 chapters to find out what he really meant. And then he so much as said that tr free tr true free trade has to be free of privilege. And that land monopoly is the privilege. And Terence Powderly's argument was basically, well, if land monopoly is a privilege and it's not free trade anyhow until you get rid of land monopoly, then labor would really appreciate it if you would start with that and say we have to get rid of land monopoly and, and we have to, you know, get rid of taxation of trade in, you know, um, what is the sales tax? Is it sales tax is, is a tariff on domestic exchange rather than, you know, tariff is by definition a tax on international exchange. But a sales tax is the same thing and it means that I'm not free to trade with you, you know, that if I, if I trade with you, I have to charge you a sales tax and collect it and forward it to the government, and then I have to pay an income tax on the profits that I made, and so that's not free trade. And so the first issue, and I, I made a booklet on this, and I, I printed a very small number of them on my inkjet printer because... Um, because I didn't have the, the funds to print large numbers of them. But the ones I gave to union people were well received. And so the, the first thing is, you know, now that the tariffs are coming from Trump, people are much more open to the idea of free trade than when the <laughs> tariffs were coming from Democrats. Yeah. And, um, and our guacamole was expensive today at the hotel. I'm, a guacamole at a hotel is always expensive, but Asamu always made guac, Asamu always made guacamole for hospitality. He said, I'm not doing guacamole this year because avocados are so, suddenly so expensive. And, um... Great no one, you're easy to win. Hmm? No tequila either? Huh? There's no tequila either? No tequila. No. Same thing. But anyhow, the question I was grappling with is how, does la how do you deal with labor on the trade issue? So I wrote this little booklet and I basically used the trade issue to promote land value tax rather than promoting free trade itself. And so I made the case that when people give us goods, they get American dollars. And except for some small countries, Peru, and you know, there's, there's some small countries that the U.S. dollar is their currency. I think Ecuador, Ecuador, the U.S. dollar is their currency. 
but they account for like 1% of the dollars in circulation. So if countries buy U.S. goods or sell us, if countries sell us Chinese goods or Mexican goods or Japanese goods, they can only use that money to buy things from the United States. And libertarians will say, buy products from the United States. And to a degree that's true because some of our products, some of our products use cheap labor. So we tend to export agricultural products because the labor is very poorly paid. Agricultural labor is very pay poorly paid. And a lot of the agricultural labor is Mexicans anyhow. But, um, but they also buy land and they buy U.S. debt. So they're not exchanging labor products for labor products. They're giving us labor products, and they're making us tenants of theirs and, um, and indentured servants to them at a national level because we, we owe, you know, part of our public debt is owed to, 8% is owed to China and 7% is owed to, owed to Japan. So, what are, what are we doing? Well, if we got rid of debt money and went to a system where we pay down our debts by creating debt-free money and we tell the banks they can't create debt money, um, that would take care of that. And if, if we went to land value tax, I mean, they bought up California. They started buying California very aggressively right after Prop 13 passed. So 18, the California Department of Agriculture said 18 months after Prop 13 passed, foreign ownership of California land doubled. Well, that tells me that, that it's in labor's interest to fight land monopoly and banking privilege in order to fight against foreign competition and people moving their plants off, offshore. So that's, that's the first issue that I came across, and I wanted to see, first of all, anybody in the union people have a, an opinion on how, how you would take that to the unions. The one thing I suggested is that we're not asking you to support free trade. We're asking you to look at this issue, which is an undercurrent. So, anybody have a... Well, once they buy all our land, then we can export a lot more than we import. Wouldn't we be happy? Right here. Once, uh, once they buy all the land, we can export. We would export a lot more than we import, but we wouldn't be... We'd be exporting the way Ireland exported yeah, for a yeah. long, long time. <laughs> I made the example, there were, four, there were four reasons to dump goods. One was to get other people's land. One was to get other people into debt to you. But the other two were to pay off the rent when other people already on your land, which is Ireland, and to get out from massive international debts that your country owes, which is Brazil. Brazil, for a long time, was accused of dumping cheap steel, and they absolutely were, but they were doing it because they were being squeezed, that they had international debts. So there's the four, the four reasons to dump goods are to get the country's land, to get the country in debt to you, because some other country already got your land, or because you're in debt to them. And all four of those cause you to dump, dump goods, to sell goods cheaper than, <coughs> than a normal markup would be. But what do we do with that for labor people? How do we, how do we make them deal with that as something they want to support. Anybody have a... Well, I'll just add a little... Second, I got it, Mike. Okay. This, this may seem like a smaller issue, but actually there are a lot of people, one of the largest employers in the United States is the United States Postal Service, and there are some rules about international trade uh, or international postal rates that uh, seem to show there's some corruption there. Just like uh, Trump uh, says we're going to have tariffs, oh, except for this, except for that. 
I often wondered, working sorting packages, why we had these tiny little packages coming from China and the declared value was very small. Because I knew that for you to ship something to China, you're going to pay $15, $20 minimum. Most of those things you order from China, you cannot return economically unless they've set up a U.S. thing. After some research, I found a Washington Post article that showed someone in the government, uh, I, perhaps the Postal Service, had negotiated a deal where people could ship things from China to us for a ridiculously low rate, a dollar or two. In fact, far cheaper than uh, you can ship things from one state to another. And I say this, <laughs> yeah, and so the people... The U.S. is paying eat, the, the freight? Yeah, well, you could argue that they're being subsidized. That was an argument made about the contract with Amazon, that maybe we were favoring the big monopoly. Uh, we were, in, in this case, the Postal Service is not favoring uh, the small seller. Uh, and quite a few goods are sold by individuals now in the age of the internet. Quite a few packages are transported by the Postal Service. We're not, we may ship fewer letters, but there's a lot more packages go through the Postal Service. And there is a corruption uh, in the mission of the Postal Service in respect to that. Uh, and it does a lot of time involve the international shipments. And I believe it's specific to China, that particular agreement. Um, or I do not see a British or other countries, uh, underdeveloped, let's say third world countries, shipping small low value items affordably, selling them on the internet, shipping them into the United States. But you, you as a US resident do not have the right or the rates that favor you shipping overseas, or even good rates to ship from one state to another. Who's paying the, the who's some, subsidizing, the US or Chinese yeah. government? Do you have the other mic, please? I, I don't know if there's a subsidy involved. I don't know if there's a subsidy involved in the Amazon contract, the high volume contract. But I can just tell you that the cheapest well, rates of all are for a Chinese, merch, a Chinese manufacturer selling cheap stuff to get it into the United States and displace sales by U.S. So uh, producers saying, or resellers. So you're saying that it could be. Okay. If you two want to talk to each so other, we can. Yeah. <laughs> there's people waiting to, to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's next, and then Gib, I think. <laughs> um, you were saying about uh, how unions would uh, be more warming to use. I, I feel that the, the reason that they're against free trade is the way it's being used. So, because that's really how they're doing the outsourcing. And that's how it became such a, a great uh, dismantling of the unions. Uh, and I feel that you, you would have to stop uh, allowing the offshoring, you know, and show them proof that, uh, that you're stopping uh, companies here uh, investing over, overseas to taking away the jobs that should be beat and kept created here. Just like the steel, you see what, uh, what, what, what's happened with that industry and other industries that are moving other places and taking away the jobs. And, and believe it or not, how many people are coming to the United States to work and looking for work? And the generations that are coming up, the kids that are coming up, how are they gonna be able to support themselves? So those are the things that they are really concerned with, you know, the, 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 the unions. So uh, if you could answer that, then maybe they can go forward with you. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that reinforces the idea that I don't want to try to get them to support free trade. No. I want to I get them to support land value tax. And my argument would be, wouldn't it be great if their tax burden is just as great if they shut down that mill Amen. and, and build, a, build, a, build a mill in, in Mexico? Wouldn't it be great if their taxes here in Pennsylvania were, were just as high on the mill when it's shut down as it is when it's open? Wouldn't that make, wouldn't that, make a, that property a real burden to them? Yes, sir. And if they had to let go of it, wouldn't somebody else do something productive there? But maybe they wouldn't let go of it at all because maybe they're not being taxed for producing. They're only being taxed for holding that land. You know, can't take your land to the Cayman Islands or to uh, Mexico or China or, or any of those places. So if we tax land, we, 
we kind of keep them here. Amen. I just, I just think it's that uh, uh, the change yeah. of them having to wait, the jobs they're going to lose from not being functional, and then that, that period of waiting for it to take into hand the land value tax. I think that's a big Yeah. Deal. Well, that was Gompers' thing. He said, you know, I'm supporting things that we can win now. And so I'm wondering how do we how do we say to people we don't you don't have to like march for this. You don't have to make this your core issue. But could you quietly tell your elected officials that you'd like to see land value tax in Pennsylvania? Make it a bit of a back burner issue for the unions, but still quietly support it. And maybe they could do that. Maybe if we had privately said that to Gompers instead of attacking him publicly. That would have happened a long time ago. Gib was... When you talk about labor unions, you really need to separate the, the unions that are here, uh, electrical workers, uh, utility workers of all sorts, nurses, teachers, police, firefighters, railroad workers. Those people are not exporting anything. No, that's a different situation with automobiles and steel and all the other things. But we need to recognize, as Adam Smith said, that free, there is no such thing as total free trade, that it is free trade as much as practical <laughs> or possible. That we all, there are international laws that outlaw child labor, so you can't have child labor performing certain functions and then exporting the product, as is prison labor, that uh, there are international rules against that. There are many products that we cannot bring in or do things with because there are cultural prohibitions for it. China, at one point, was giving us gloves and uh, winter coats that had dog fur on it. And we, as a culture, do not typically have uh, dog furs, although people used to wear fox furs, but uh, they are in the canine family, but not necessarily dogs. But we stopped importing China winter wear that had dog fur on it because that was just too, uh, too much of a cultural uh, problem for us. We cannot import lion skins and all sorts of those items, but you can pay for a safari to Africa and people will take you out on a big game hunt and you can kill yourself a lion or a giraffe. You just can't, uh, you can't bring that skin back. So that uh, what, what might be free labor or free trade to us, everyone has those things. We all are aware that they're, they're we cannot import ivory, but if you wanted to go into places that had elephants on the free market, that there are ivory chess sets all over the place. If you want to play chess with an ivory board in Kenya, you can do that. You just can't bring it back with you. And uh, there is no prohibition on ivory trade. I have a couple of pieces of ivory that I bought uh, trinkets uh, many, many years ago. It is not against the law for me to give them to you or give them as a gift to anyone or even to sell them domestically, but we just cannot import them anymore. So there are many, many exceptions, some of them cultural, some of them we want to save the elephants and, and other things, save the whales, but uh, you can get a nice whale sandwich in uh, Iceland, but we have decided that whale meat is not being sold here, as is horse meat. We cannot eat horse meat here. Uh, if you have a horse, you can slaughter it and have a barbecue for I yourself. Think, I think we have enough examples to get to the okay. point. <laughs> um, so the question remains: What what would you what would labor respond to? Higher what, wages. What what could we ask them? Uh, well, higher wages is a different another topic, and we can maybe that should be next. That's all they care about, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I 
I have, I think I have one or two copies in the back of a little booklet I made called How to Raise Wages in Your Community. And um, it was the idea that, that, you know, I used Lindy's um, Law of Rent illustrations with the trees and the baskets of produce and stuff and basically said, we had the highest wages in the world and no minimum wage laws. Um, you know, in the, in the 1800s, we had the highest wages anywhere in the world. And this was borne out by a uh, prominent socialist named Werner Sombart came to the United States. And he wrote a book called Why Is There No Socialism in the United States? And he said, they're better housed. Their employers treat them with great solicitude because it's, it, at that time, and it wasn't true in the sweatshop cities. The sweatshop cities were Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Because the influx of labor, of immigrants, was so fast and furious that as, fa as fast as an immigrant escaped poverty by going west, two new immigrants <laughs> were available. To, but in most of the United States, um, wages were dramatically higher than they were in Europe. And employers were as worried about losing an employee as employees were about losing their jobs. And so he goes on about how solicitous they were, how the American war, it's on my, it's on the Saving Communities website, um, but that um, it gave people a pride, they said they would, they, uh, an American would ad address the neighborhood butcher the same way as he would address the governor of Pennsylvania, which, which is not the way things were in Europe. So um, there were sweatshops in this country, like Press Steel Car and and King's Ross, and Okay, your your def the the American definition of sweatshops. And the European definition of sweatshops is two different things. The American, the American sweatshops, the worst labor in American history was still way better. And this is not, this is not a defender of America saying this. This was, this was a socialist that uh, Engels said he's the only German professor who really understands capital, uh, Marx's book Capital. So this was his statement that, that American labor was treated vastly better than European labor. Now by today's standards, those were sweatshops. In but a steel car company, when a worker was killed on the job, they didn't even pause the picket line. They just kicked the body aside and went right on. That, Sombart covers that as well. He said the American worker would much, he said the one thing the American worker does not demand is safety. And he, he was amazed at that, but he said the American worker would rather have higher pay than safer conditions because he, the American worker's attitude is, I'm here temporarily, if I succeed, I get out, I start a business for myself, or I go and buy some farmland, or I work a better job, where the European worker his mentality was, I'm going to be doing this for my entire life, and so I don't want to get killed and maimed or whatever. But the American worker's attitude about safety, I mean, this was Sombart again, his attitude about safety was, I'm willing to give that up to get the opportunity to better myself. It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting read. Not to speak um, out, but it's not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. Working about safety is the number one issue. Yeah. I'm just saying you can even ask the post guy. Yeah. It, it, no, I'm talking about the 1880s. Right. Right. Um, talking about now, we kind of need to make sure we know who is the labor movement. Sorry, guys. Who does labor represent? Just, I'm not trying to make a point, but our discussion would best if we keep up to date on how many million workers are in unions, 
What unions? Are they exportable products? Are they services? Are they coal miners or teachers? If we hope to find our best opportunities to propose that they support social justice measures, non-workplace issues as labor unions. And over the last 20 or 50 years, the labor movement has shrunk and also changed in who it represents and how well they're paid. Some union workers are still just modestly paid. Other times in construction, they only represent the highest paid sectors. Well, what, what do you suggest in terms of, well, of a, an actual pitch to labor? That, how do know, you use that information? Know who to go to okay. and know what they're interested in because the $100,000 a year construction workers union may have different things they feel would win them support from their members as would the coal miners union who are also relatively well paid or the service employees union. And they are exporters. Uh, well, coal, yeah. We export a lot. Yeah. We don't import coal. Sure, there are a variety of issues. Uh, hospital health care is a big issue for, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the service unions. They represent in hospitals techs who make good money and they represent the housekeepers. And so, uh, so land what's, value tax. What's our might, pitch to the SEIU? Uh, it might be the land value tax, you know? It might be yeah. something that affects housing. And there are many things besides land yeah. value because those housekeepers, uh, those lower paid hospital workers, have certain things okay. would benefit. What I'm looking for here, we have an image of a worker. We have an SEIU employee who works in a nursing home, for example. Yeah. A lot of SEIU employees work in a nursing home. What's our pitch to that employee? That's, that's where I want us to start thinking of, is thinking in terms of outreach. Who are these people? What do they want? Obviously not all labor wants the same thing. Um, although there are some things that all labor wants. And higher wages. One thing is that all labor is scared about their loss of power. In, in 1950, half the people who were working belonged to a union. And now it's about 13% and, um, and sliding. So that number's old. It might be 11% by the time, you know. And one of the things that Terence Powderly and Henry George both defined labor as anybody who's contributing to the production of wealth. So Powderly excluded lawyers and bankers. <laughs> but he said, and he included bank tellers. But he said, lawyers and bankers cannot join the Knights of Labor. But anybody else, we consider them to, if you're a producer or you're not a producer. Now, by that definition, labor has an overwhelming majority. And, if, and so the issue of land value tax benefits, if labor starts crusading for land value tax, labor's crusading for the majority. And originally, when labor was very unpopular, and organized labor was very popular in America until the 1870s, and one was the frontier started closing, but the, the big one was called the crime of 72, which was when government started taking us off the gold standard and putting us back into fractional reserve gold, um, gold money. And it was a massive recession. It's called the Long Recession. It's, it, it ran from the 1870s, and depending on how you define it, it ran into the late 1990s. Or eight, 1890s, late, late 1890s. And that galvanized labor. And that, and Henry George and... Um, the Catholic Church attacking labor and, and powderly having to make everything public, those things combined to cause an explosion in the popularity of American labor. And people said the same things about labor they're saying today. That the closed shop is, is a monopoly thing. That, that, that labor is getting a higher pay at your expense as a consumer. And they, they said all those things. And the American people's reaction was, Labor's taking on the banks, the land monopolists, and the railroads. And we hated the banks and the land monopolists and the railroads way more than we disliked labor unions. And so American people rallied behind labor and it, it launched the, the labor movement. 
because of that. So, um, I, but I, I, I think uh, I, I could see them uh, giving you more backing if you can give them uh, a more guarantee that they're going to have work so available to them in the future. You know what I'm saying? Down the line, because what we just had happen here, I mean, look, look at artificial intelligence. All those things that are coming up in the future that are going to be taking away work from them. So you got to have something that, that you can explain to them that, uh, that you're going to have, that there's going to be work on them being able to survive. If, if it's not work, if maybe it may be uh, a universal uh, <coughs> income or something that, that, uh, that could be, that, that, uh, land value is going to bring forward. Can you get the other mic? Yeah, I, what, I, what I was going to say is that you should moderate this. So yeah. you know, when I'm when I'm back here, sometimes I can't see other people. Okay. So when you want somebody to talk, uh, they're going to raise their hand and you point at them. And we I'll, need both remote mics. Yeah, and I'll take the mic over. We, in, oh, can I say something? Yeah. 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 Testing. Is he bringing the mic? Or? No, you're you're not up yet. He is. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Just a couple of complications. Uh, for I, I was 20 years as a letter carrier, and the, the shop steward and I, every November, we were always befuddled by half of our shop voted, you know, for Trump or Bush. Or, they voted against the, the slate that we received from the union. They were so I was, you know, half the letter carriers were basically voting against what the union wanted. So I don't know. Mike, Michael Moore did a video um, on there's somebody in the two people him and Brendan um, did a video about a month before the election saying Donald Trump's going to win this, and all the polls were saying that the video is you can get it on YouTube is Michael Moore explaining why Trump was going to win, and he said because the Democratic Party was so wrapped up in identity politics and all this um, socialist elitist kind of virtue signaling stuff because it was easy. It's really easy to be pro-black because it's a symbolic statement. There was a lot of symbolic commitment on the part of the Democratic Party to a whole variety of minorities. But none of it had real substance to it. And in the meantime, organized labor felt like they were just being totally ignored. And he said, he said it's like they had all their fingers chopped off except this one. And they were going to use that finger to vote for Trump. And they did. And they did. And, and so, you know, the, the question is how do you, how do you, if neither side is really doing anything for labor, and Trump, you can argue if you're one, if you work for one of the businesses that is being protected by the tariffs, at least your labor union is benefiting from Trump. But um, but he at least said, you know, he at least addressed average people. And he basically said, look, if y'all are going to play identity politics for all these different minorities, I can play identity politics for white people. And the left just got outraged and said, that's racism, that's racism. And it's like, yeah, you're right, and so is it when you play identical identity politics. So he basically odd identity the ide he, he played identity politics with the majority. And it's crass, and it, it makes the country worse. But maybe if somebody realizes that we need to stop doing it because they can do it too, um, maybe in the long run it'll be better. Um, yeah. I was uh, getting back to your point from five minutes ago. Uh, could we? Labor used to emphasize and respond to arguments about lower cost of living. Wouldn't that be a winning argument? To make to labor, why, why the policies that we are promoting will result in in overall lower cost of living. Even if your current wages don't go up, you're going to be able to buy more stuff. Wouldn't that be a good argument? 
It might be. It might be a little abstruse for getting them to. I mean, the, my sense of it is there's that which gets them to agree with you and nod their head and say you're right, and then there's that which gets them to cut you a check or to um, invite you to speak at a meeting or um, or start publishing things in their newsletter. The the question is. The threshold is not that we're right. The threshold is that we are, we are a priority. Even if we're a low priority, we're not any priority at all. And so my question is, how does that make us a priority? So um, Brendan and Bob and Walt and John, pretty much in that order. Just um, two quick comments. Uh, one of my friends hosted, is at the um, cabin up in Canada, up in Ontario, uh, just outside Ottawa. And he's hosting um, lab labor economists that are going out for the day to talk. And, and that got me thinking when I was listening to you, Dan, is that that's a conversation I would like to have with the labor economists, because most of the large union have their own economists. L listen to them and what, what do they say, say to you? And the second thing, in British Columbia, um, in Vancouver, um, the largest labor union there, independently of any Georgia's organization, had been writing for the last two or three years about land value taxation. Because with the high price of housing in, in the lower mainland, so, so that's another group that we should be going to, these that maybe aren't Georges, but are, are, are talking about the Georges message, message, and it's partly Adam's point about here, about the cost of living. They're coming on it because it doesn't matter how much you earn if you're spending a million and a half on a, on, on a home. You know, you can't keep up with the mortgage. So that's all done. Thanks. And um, who was? Greg Gusen. Yeah, and then Bob Jean. Did you have some? Oh yeah, I didn't know you. Uh, yes, um, all of the points you made are, are a absolutely correct in terms of how labor would be helped by the collection of the rents. But there's one thing that I think probably is the big obstacle, and that is that the one thing that labor could sort of look to as a way of getting ahead is the appreciation in their the value of their home. And that is precisely what a land value tax will destroy. Yeah. Unless they don't own it. Is that so, Dan? Is that so? That, would that, that should be the result? Um, it depends on how it's done and how quickly it's done. You know, what we've had in Pennsylvania is stability which is, you know, prices didn't go up during the bubble. So I think people are happy that their prices didn't go up during the bubble because they, they, they didn't go down when the bubble burst. So it depends on how fast you do it, what taxes you replace, a um, bunch of things. Bob? Okay, uh, you're saying that labor is uh, people that are producing things. And, and which means they're probably mostly hourly. And if you're an hourly employee, one of the things you can't get away from is the income tax. And, and so we could say, we're gonna shift all taxes onto land and therefore you won't have to pay income tax anymore. Wouldn't that be a, a strong uh, well, the argument? The majority of hourly workers don't pay income tax. Um, that was Mitt Romney's complaint that only 40% of the people were paying income tax. What? They pay payroll taxes, oh, yeah. which are quite high. And so I would agree with you. I would just substitute the word payroll tax. Oh, payroll. The difficulty with More that. Savings account. The difficulty with that is our our opportunities to pass land value tax are local, and theoretically state. And the payroll tax is federal. So can you, get, can you get your local government to collect land value tax and use some of it to rebate the payroll tax of anybody working in your juris jurisdiction? That's, that's a tough sell when you haven't sold land value tax as a local thing. But we have, local, we have a wage tax in Pittsburgh. So um, 
Jack Wagner, who, who was very tight with labor, um, got us to lower the wage tax and replace it with land value tax. Yeah. With mostly, we, we had a six to one millage ratio of land to buildings. Yeah. And he kept the six to one ratio and increased it by, um, he increased the building and the land, but in that same six to one ratio. And that was a compromise with the people who didn't like land value tax. Um, and Walt was, yeah. Uh, labor suffers from the lack of jobs and the lack of industry, great decline. How about make, offering them the chance to, instead of having industry go to tax havens, make America the tax haven? How do you do that with the land tax? <laughs> And, um, oh, there was, he was saying one of the things we're losing is to, is to automation. And I don't want to get into this because our next topic is basic income. Uh, so I'll let Steve talk about that. But I always say to people, you know, they say, well, we should tax all these new inventions that are automating the process and driving people out. And I, I said, well, what... Do you think that the, the people who own the machinery, that that machinery is growing in value because... So how old is your cell phone? You know, if your cell phone is two years old, what was it worth when it came out? And what is it worth now? If anything has fallen faster than wages, it's new technology. New technology is the fastest falling you know, now there's newer technology still, and they are replacing jobs. But the value of capital. But the value, it's not the value of capital. Technology is labor efficient. It, that means it lets you produce more product with less payroll. Now, less payroll doesn't necessarily mean fewer workers. It means you can hire low-skilled workers instead of high-skilled workers, because a low-skilled worker can punch the keyboard on a McDonald's cash register and doesn't have to even do new numbers. He, he just punches the hamburger button and it calculates it. There's no, the, the McDonald's worker can be completely enumerate and it doesn't matter because the machine takes, oh, the only thing that has to, the McDonald's worker has to punch in is that you gave him a $20, $20 bill and he punches in $20 and the machine spits out the change. So, and now you can punch it in. You don't even need a worker to work the cash register. There's a kiosk and you order it yourself, right? And it just comes out. So, that's, we're, it's labor efficient, but it's not natural resource efficient. Because that machine requires natural resources. That robot is burning electricity. You're burning food. And that food, you know, you had to eat food anyhow. So, so if we put somebody on welfare, they still eat. George's, the, the land value tax makes labor efficiency less important. And it makes land and resource efficiency very important. Especially the variant, you know, royalties on coal, royalties on oil, royalties on copper and stuff, those things would give labor a huge advantage over automation because automation is a huge resource con controller or consumer. And, and part of why it's a resource consumer is that old robot, in five years they're going to melt that old robot down and build a new robot. So labor, <laughs> not at the post office. Well, we got 40-year-old machines. So, um, so, you know, that's, to me, that's the big thing about labor efficiency. Um, do we have, I think John was going to speak, and then um, Dave Wetzel is going to speak, so. Can I get in the queue? Uh, John, behind you. There was. Yeah, I think it's on. Okay. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about identity politics 
and you, you made the point that we're playing identity politics with the African Americans and the uh, and women Latinos. And, yeah. There's a, that's the distinction I'm going to. Um, and Trump's been playing the identity politics too and winning. Now there's a significant difference. There's one other group when they are the majority in this society and the majority of workers for that matter. And um, that's why a, a major factor behind the Democratic victory in the 2018 election was the women candidates. And it's why I say we need uh, we need a president, uh, we need to end minority rule, meaning us men folk in this country. That's a, a minority, that's an identity issue that it's absolutely vital and there are issues that can't be backed away from, particularly starting with reproductive rights. And Trump, is, Trump and his people are... Yeah, I, I want to... I wanna... Pull us into how, what you're saying, how is it going to get unions to support us? I want to make that because, connection. <laughs> because more and more workers are women in unions. Look at mm -hmm. some of your union leaders like Rosemary Trump. Well, your time is up. What, the, what, the session is over? Yep. No. Those bands just keep our uh, audience going. Yeah. I want to be in the line for it. It's supposed uh, to be over, okay. isn't it? Two o'clock? Okay. I don't know. I don't have the. Okay. Yeah, we got more. In terms of uh, trade unions, they're probably pretty different in the UK to what you have here. Um, I heard one person say your trade unions are only interested in higher wages, but that's certainly not the case in, in, in the UK, they're concerned about holidays. Um, most workers now have five weeks holiday, um, as well as bank holidays, uh, usually uh, I think it's eight bank holidays. They're concerned about pensions, and indeed um, negotiate to keep, they're concerned about their jobs existing and negotiate uh, lower pensions in order to uh, enable a firm like Tata, Indian owned, uh, to uh, reduce its costs and continue making steel in, in the UK. Certainly safety I've heard mentioned and mm -hmm. that's very much uh, uh, every uh, shop steward uh, also has a safety rep. They're not uh, uh, blind to the needs of people's health and safety. They're worried about their local communities. Um, equality of treatment so that people being promoted or disciplined are, are fairly treated and the union will represent people uh, that have a grievance. They're concerned about uh, housing, that has been mentioned and certainly in, in the UK. Uh, and they're concerned about uh, unemployment. What we've done is not to attack um, selfishness, not to attack uh, socialism, I speak as a socialist. I was really offended. The first time I came to a CGO, uh, Frank Peddle had just published a book mm -hmm. and I started reading his book and I got to the third page before he was attacking socialism. Now, he justified it when I challenged him by saying, well, I also attack capitalism. I said, well, that's fine. If you don't want the capitalists to support you, attack them. But if uh, I say to capitalists that land value tax is in your interest, it's only the rentiers are our enemy, and the capitalists aren't our enemy, and certainly the socialists. Now, I'm speaking as a socialist. Uh, I don't consider myself as being the enemy of, of the Henry George message. I think the Henry George message is, is important for socialism. And where socialism has gone wrong, and I'm not talking about communism, but we could go into detail about that as well. 
But in terms of social democratic governments in Europe, where they've gone wrong is they've ignored the Henry George message. And they should be harnessing land wealth to enable to provide the social services and the goodies they want to give workers. Um, what we've done, we formed, first of all, I, I almost would like to ask a question. How many people in this room have actually attended a trade union meeting to discuss Henry George on land value tax? And we got one? One person? No. Well, me, oh, two? Well, and me. I, I've done many. Uh, um, I started you in... A, a union meeting to promote Henry George? Uh, yeah, Michael yeah, Trump absolutely. Like and I get invited to go. You, you speak at one group, and then somebody else will invite you to another group. I've spoken to uh, conferences where they um, have um, seminars and things like that. Um, and um, I started in 1983, the Labour Land Campaign. Now, that's not the Labour Party campaign. It's the Labour Movement Campaign. And any trade unionist, any cooperator, any member of any political party except for a racist party... Uh, could join us. And um, as I speak now, um, several three unions off the top of my head have passed resolutions at their annual conferences in favour of land value tax. That's uh, the PCS, they represent civil servants. RMT, um, they represent train workers, railway workers, uh, and also people in shipping, because for history, uh, the cross-channel ferries came under RMT. Uh, they used to be the rail ferries. And uh, UNITE, which is the Union for the Transport Workers and the Engineers, broadly speaking, and anybody unemployed can join UNITE. Um, they've passed a resolution. Uh, the Trades Union Congress, which is all the trade, or most of the trade unions coming together, they have passed a, a, a resolution. And the reason we gave importance to the trade unions is because we wanted the Labour Party to adopt land value tax. And in our country, the, in our Labour Party, the trade unions are a tremendous fundraiser and they are a tremendous voice within the movement. Uh, or even though the, Tony Blair ignored them completely with his <laughs> policies. But nevertheless... At the last general election, 2017 general election, um, when uh, Theresa May's majority fell, she thought she was going to get a bigger majority, the Labour Party included annual land value tax as a op an option for reforming local taxation. They didn't say it was the option, but one, it was an option. Uh, and so, And since then... The Shadow Chancellor has mentioned land value tax as being one of the tools in his toolbox on many occasions on, on the main media. Now, we don't claim the credit for all that. There's lots of other things happening uh, in, in the UK regarding L LVT. But certainly, the important message I would give you, you actually want to influence the trade unions, is not necessarily to do what Dan's doing and emphasise in your mind what is it they want to hear, and I'll go and give them the ice cream that they want to hear about. But we have a message that we know is going to be good for workers. We know it. They don't know it. And all we have to do, I feel, is to go and express that. And you do it in a number of ways. You've, somebody's mentioned, I think it was Dan, writing articles. Yeah, writing articles in the socialist press, writing articles in as many papers uh, as you possibly can, sending letters. I, I believe, in, well, I, I, I ought to patent the Dave Wetzel snooker uh, approach to suggesting LVT or getting the message across. I imagine us all standing around a huge snooker table and we've all got one ball in our hand and we roll that ball because we want to try and get the black ball pocketed. And our ball doesn't get the black ball pocketed, but everybody else is rolling balls, and the balls are all colliding with each other, and eventually one ball knocks the black ball into the pocket. Now, we all have the ability to write letters to the local press, we have the ability to write letters to the national press, I'm offering 
often getting letters into the Financial Times, which is read by a few people, but influential, influential people. We can all perhaps um, address a meeting locally. Um, Try to wrap up. We're six minutes over. Okay, I'll shut up. Thanks. Uh, I, I do want to say very quickly. I had a, an Ethiopian socialist. Uh, we're done. We're going. We can't do any more right now. Um, there was an Ethiopian socialist living in my house, and I complained about socialism. He said. Yes, but you've only experienced American socialists, and American socialists are the dumbest socialists on the planet. So I don't want to project anything on the European socialists. I only know the dumb ones, according to this. But you're not going to win them by saying that to them. We're done. Yeah. Okay. What's next? Uh, Steve Schafferman is the... We have. Well, I'm going to get a dividend.